the the f hello liberty lovers and welcome to the liberty mike podcast broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of dixie i am michael and i'm here with liberty larry how's it going i'm doing all right how are you pretty good yeah, yeah. all right so what you sipping on <laughs> So we are, we are responding to our criticisms very quickly. Um, I am drinking the most frequently mentioned uh, whiskey, I think, on the podcast, which is Rittenhouse Rye. That's a good one. Yeah. I almost went for that when we were picking out whiskeys, but I was um, something else caught my eye. So and it was? The Basil Hayden, the Caribbean? Yeah, Caribbean cask. Yeah, this stuff uh, is good. Like it's it has a very unique flavor. Like it's different. It's almost yeah. it's a rum finish, right? It's a rum finish. Yeah, yeah. and it, to me, it almost reminds me like of like a coffee flavor, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's what I remember about it. Yeah, I'm just not a huge fan of Basil Hayden. I am. Um, I like it, and I really like this. Like I say, I'm glad I picked that up. Yeah. This may be my go to for a couple of more weeks. The um the stuff you brought over earlier this week, uh. It was it was good. I just like a bolder, uh, it bolder was, flavor. So um, so that was the Basil Hayden toast, right? Um, and it was um, it was really good. But but you're right. It's a, definitely a very light flavor, which most Basil Haydens are. But um, but it had a good a good taste to it. I liked it. Yeah, Basil Hayden to me is like the whiskey you drink if you don't like whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the traditionally the problem I've always had with those bottles is when I open them, we finish them. Whoever I open them with usually yeah. is who I finish it with. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, you didn't have that problem with me because I didn't I, have that problem the other <laughs> night. I, I put a little bit in the bottom of a glass so that I could taste it, and then I switched to something else. Yeah. Well, and I didn't finish the bottle, so yeah. <laughs> it wasn't a bottle finishing night. So. No, it, it wasn't. Um. Oh, I get that reminds. Me, I have something to tell you when the. When we turn the tape off. All right. Um, well, so uh, we we were talking after the last podcast, um, something that I had intended to mention that I didn't put in my notes because I thought, surely it'll just come up organically and I don't need to make a specific note about this. And you and, were wrong. And I, yeah, I was wrong. <laughs> but um, as an addendum, I guess, to our, our last uh, podcast, um, I wanted to talk that the, you know, this result of, um, well, government generally, but, um, you know, on the taxation issue is that you end up like, this is a classed society. Yeah. Uh, and, and from my perspective, there's really two classes and those are the taxpayers and the tax consumers. Yeah. Uh, and I, I do want to point out that the tax consumers isn't just public employees, um, it's not oh, just, yeah. you know, your, your government public, employees. Yeah. Um, it includes uh, all these businesses that would not exist without government contracts. Now, the thing that you can point to most easily is, of course, the military industrial, the military contractors. Yeah. Um, people are, are businesses like uh, Raytheon and Lockheed Martin and General Dynamics and um, Northrop Grumman and all these things that are, you know, 90 plus percent of their revenue is from government contracts. And they don't have anything to sell on the market to normal consumers. Um, Boeing is a big government contractor also, but something like 70% of their revenue is is private sales uh, yeah. of airlines and stuff. But yeah. Um, but, but the, the rest, rest of, those, of those guys, yeah, they're that's they're all their money comes from mm -hmm. us. <laughs> yeah, would not exist without government contracts, and so there it, it is a privatization of public funds. Yeah. Um. So the government steals money from you, gives money to them for whatever you know project they want them to work on, and then uh, just to add insult to injury, um, they take that money that they get from the government, they give it back to the government in the forms uh, of lobbyists to get more government contracts to get more of your money. It's insane. <laughs> Um, so those are, those are really the classes. And I, I was talking to a friend a while back and we were, we were debating, um, the issue of taxes and, uh, and he was saying that my employer has far more impact on my, um, economic life, uh, than, um, uh, than government taxes. <laughs> and 
I was, I yeah. told him I, I, yeah, I don't know how you not be just struck by that. Yeah. I, I couldn't even, I couldn't even form an argument at the time because I was like, you know, I've never had to like defend this position. <laughs> right. Um, so, uh, but I have spent some time thinking about it since then. And, and first off, literally 40% or more between 40 and 50% of my total income goes to taxes of one form or another. Yeah. yeah. All right. So in this scenario, my employer is helping me out quite a bit, and my government is hindering me quite a bit. <laughs> All right. Like 40% quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's actually closer to half when you, when you calculate when you everything, really like get. sales taxes and yeah. everything else that you end up paying. But, um, but another part of it is all of these big government projects that I'm taxed for that I get no benefit from whatsoever. Yeah. Um, the, you know, I, I am, I am not benefiting from the arms industry selling millions and millions of dollars worth of weapons to Ukraine. In fact, I would say that I'm in worse position because of this. Okay. Um, and there's so many other things too. I mean, but the, you know, that's the big one. Yeah. 25% of, um, government revenue goes towards the military in one form or another. Yeah. So anyway, um, I did want to, you know, make it a point to, to bring that up and to give you, and I'm not trying to create um, conflict. Like this isn't a, an excuse to go out and attack your local public school teacher or something well, yeah. um, because no. they're stealing money from you. You know, that's not, that's not really the case. I mean, the, the, the culprit is the government itself, not their employees. It's the um, politicians. It's the policy makers. Yeah. Um, and, and that's another point to make too. Uh, so there's a quote that I, I recently learned while it's attributed to George Washington, and I've used it on this podcast before attributing it to George Washington, but I recently learned that there's actually no evidence that he ever said this. <laughs> but it's a good quote anyway. Um, he said something, or somebody. Somebody. Yeah. <laughs> somebody said something along the lines of, government is not reason, it is not eloquence, it is force. Like fire, it is a fearful, ma a dangerous servant and a fearful master. Yeah. Um, and... <clears throat> and the reason I bring that up is because uh, I've been reading uh, Sheldon Richmond's um, "How Social An What Social Animals Owe to Each Other," which is a, a collection of a lot of essays. I don't know how many. Um, and uh, I, I was at the doctor the other day, and and one of the guys there um, saw the book sitting, and he said, "So, what is it that social animals owe to each other?" Yeah. <laughs> I was caught off guard by that one too. Um, I was like, well, that's not, that's not exactly an easy answer. I said, but truthfully, like a lot of it is exactly what you would think, yeah. you know, uh, is to be respectful, be honest. Um, don't be aggressive, like, um, peace and, uh, and respect. I was like, that's really the bulk of it. I said, but I, I would, you know, and I, I told him a little bit about the, um, you know, the idea of, uh, equality of authority uh, no one's subject to anyone else. Um, anybody can break off a relationship. Uh, the, you know, the, the, this is an important part that you can't hold somebody in thrall essentially. Yeah. Um, but the part that I, you know, and then we got, we had to do, I had to do something. So I, you know, I, I didn't get to finish the conversation, but I was thinking, you know, I probably left out the most important part, which is, you know, something that Sheldon Richmond brings up a lot. Um, is that the other thing that you owe is to not use the government to um, inflict someone up something upon others that you wouldn't be able to do personally. Yeah. Right. Like that you wouldn't you wouldn't have the moral authority to do personally. And so that again relates back to what we were talking about last week that a government shouldn't have the authority to do anything that a, an individual wouldn't. Yeah. Um, and this is a moral position. And so it the. I guess what I'm trying to say here is that um, the moral position is also, even if your government has overstepped the authority that, that is given, like you have a moral responsibility not to use that tool to forcefully impose your position, whatever it happens to be, onto others. Yeah, just because you have that ability to, to use government in that way doesn't mm -hmm. make it right. Yeah. It's not an excuse to, it doesn't make it okay. Yeah. If the only reason that you can't do, that you have to use government is because they can legally apply force where you cannot, yeah. then that's... You're still not justified. Yeah, you're in the wrong still. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
So uh, anyway, I just wanted to bring up those two points to just kind of clarify and, and add to what we were discussing last time. Yeah, absolutely. That's it. What else you got? I don't know. So I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about, so I tried to find some more stuff on it before I left the house and couldn't find as much as I wanted. But I had heard the other day on the news, and it's been brought to my attention a few times throughout the week, that Biden is wanting to declare fentanyl a weapon of mass destruction. Um, which I've had some interesting conversations throughout the week with people about that subject because as libertarians, I feel like we have a pretty good solution to the fentanyl problem. Yeah. Um, so, but just the idea that you're going to declare something, a drug, even a weapon of mass destruction is crazy to me. So like, Mm -hmm. I guess the implication there would be like, you could charge people with like treason for possessing it, possessing it. Oh (laughs) yeah, that might that might be too. Um, so my one of my first thoughts when you mentioned this to me is um, that that weapons of mass destruction is an excuse for war, and we have been ratcheting up all this rhetoric against China, um, and presumably, reportedly, yeah. uh, China is the source of a lot of the of a lot of fentanyl. Yeah. Um, now, I, the other thing I thought about is that I remember like a month or so ago I was talking to my my mom and she was. Um, like actually kind of uh, worked up about this idea that, um, you know, China was sending all this fentanyl to the U S and that, that, that they're trying to kill us. Yeah. That the, the nation of China is trying to kill the citizens of the United States with this fentanyl. And, and I remember saying to her, I was like, well, how's it, how's it getting here? And she said, well, it, you know, the Mexican uh, cartels are bringing it across the border. And I said, and then selling it to U.S. citizens, and she's like, "Yes." I said, "Well, sounds like so, it's Mexico's fault." Yeah, <laughs> I was like, "China is selling it because it's profitable." Yeah, and frankly, so are the Mexicans. But yeah. um, it, it seems to me that rather than making the case that China is trying to kill us, when China is selling it to the Mexicans and the Mexicans are selling it to the Americans, that you could make a far stronger case that the Mexicans were trying to kill us than China. Right. <laughs> um, but. Uh, yeah, the idea of using it, calling it a, a weapon of mass destruction, I think, is is just ludicrous. Um, first off, well, I understand that it's not always by choice. Like, you are engaging in dangerous behavior. You know it. Um, yeah. There's always the possibility that whatever street drugs you're buying aren't what you thought they were, are cut with something else. There's no control over dosage or anything like that. Um, this is a, this is a dangerous game that people are playing to begin with. Oh yeah. One that I'm familiar with to, yeah. to well, some degree, as and, a matter of fact. And but, that's a point I wanted to make too, is like a lot of people are familiar with. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, this is, this is something that I, I bet there's very few people that would listen to this podcast that doesn't, hasn't been touched by this in one way or another. Yeah. Um, it's just because it, because it is an epidemic like in this, Mm -hmm. and that's kind of what the point I wanted to make is like, this is a real problem. And a part of me appreciates the fact that Biden does actually want to do something about it because something, there are things that could be done. And I do think that something does need to be done. Um, the question is, what is that something? Yeah. And this this, is certainly not to dismiss it as a problem. Yeah. Um, it, it certainly is a problem. Um, uh, and I do think that there are good libertarian solutions. I do want to, um, make the point though, cause I looked up these statistics after you said you wanted to talk about this. Yeah. That, uh, so I went back to 2019 cause that's the last normal year. <laughs> fairly, that's before reality <laughs> collapsed. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, and, uh, I, I looked up the, um, the death, the, Death by cause, whatever. Anyway, yeah, I looked up the death numbers for uh, fentanyl in 2019, yeah. um, and it was about 33,725 uh, Americans died from fentanyl overdose in 2019. Yeah. Um, that same year, uh, 36,096 Americans died from auto accidents. Yeah. So, you know, I, I Americans think that you can't could, drive. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, but. <laughs> You know, if you're making the case that fentanyl is a weapon of mass destruction when it's one at a timing um, yeah. people and it's generally an accident, yeah. um, then you could still you could make the same case that an automobile is a weapon of mass destruction, well, which yeah. is obviously 
ridiculous. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, ludicrous. Don't give them any ideas, man. I like my well, car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's how they're going to force us all into mass transit, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, right. Um, so uh, now in 2021, uh, based on the statistics, there was a record number of overdoses in the U.S. in 2021. Yeah. Um, it was like 107,000 something. Well, when you lock uh, people in their houses, that yeah. things um, like that tend to happen. <laughs> two thirds of them, uh, according to the statistics, were um, synthetic opioids, which is, probably means that the, somewhere around 50,000 deaths. Uh, were caused by fentanyl. But yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a standout year, and I couldn't compare auto st- statistics. Because less again. people were on the road. Yeah, because there were lockdowns in a bunch of places in the U.S. Yeah. in 2021, various times during 2021. Um, but yeah, that's a that's probably a, a huge part in why that number is so high, yeah. is that they created a state of depression in this country by preventing uh, social interaction, like real yeah. social interaction. Absolutely. In a lot of places. Yeah. So, um, but the, you know, the libertarian solution is that you abolish the war on drugs. Yeah. Well, and cause so people are going to do drugs. Had this conversation with a handful of people this week and the reaction was always the same. Mm-hmm. Like this look of like just disgust. That <laughs> you I must would, be crazy. That I would even consider such a thought. Yeah. But I, all I did was kind of explain the fact that. Okay, so like this, we recognize this is a problem, like, and this is a very dangerous drug to handle and transport and things like that. If you had, and as much as it pains me to say so, if you had the government legalize it and uh, regulate it, mm-hmm. you would eliminate so much of that. When people go to the yeah. store and buy it, they would know what they're buying. Yeah, the problem is the black market, not exactly. the drug itself. Exactly. Um, and I would like, I, I actually am pretty happy. The people I talked to, once I kind of had a real conversation with them about it, kind of came on board and was like, you know, maybe that's not as crazy of an idea as it sounds. Yeah, the the real danger of drug use, or the, the bigger danger, I guess, of drug use in the United States um, is uh, it surrounds the black market. Um, that you don't know what you're getting. Yep. You don't know how strong it is. Um Especially when you know, it comes to a, this particular drug, because like the dosing on it, like just mm-hmm. being off just tiny amounts is changes the formula a lot. Yeah, and of course the you know the danger of the black market isn't just the drugs either. Well, yeah, um, it's all you the have violence a, that's around. Yeah, the, because you have this highly protected because it's a it's a criminal class that profits off of it. Yeah, um, because it's not legal. They're, the, they're, they're more willing to do things that aren't legal. Yeah, exactly. And it's it makes more sense to defend yeah. your product, your, your territory, stash, yeah. your whatever, yeah. your market with violence yeah. um, if it's illegal to begin with. Exactly. So, um, yeah, I, I think that that's the answer. And then, of course, you know, you uh, you deal with um, drug addiction, drug overdose, et cetera, as a medical problem instead of a criminal problem. And making it a weapon of mass destruction actually just obviously makes it more yeah. of a criminal issue. Well, yeah, it, exactly. You're not actually helping the people that need the help. Right. Um, it, it's You're just exacerbating the problem by putting them in a cage with other people with the same problem. Yeah. And, you know, you're not you're not doing anything to reduce this, like making it more criminal than it already is. All, yeah. all that really does is drive up the price. Now yeah. to some degree that will reduce demand, of course. Yeah. Um, but, uh, it, it doesn't, it doesn't drive people out of the market exactly because there's still money to be made exactly. because people want to get high. Yeah. People want these drugs. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's always have. Yeah. And yeah. always will. And yeah. there's not anything that you can do about that part. You, you're never going to to um, eliminate the demand. And if you can't eliminate the demand, you're not going to eliminate the product either. Yeah. It, well, exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, the best thing you can do is kind of like what we're saying is legalize it, mm-hmm. uh, regulate it, and then make the help available for the people who want it. Yeah. Because I think that's an important part of all of this mm-hmm. is is having that available for the people who are interested. Yeah, and I, I don't want to um, overemphasize this, but it, it also shouldn't be understated uh, that you, if you bring it into the light, if you legalize it, regulate it, et cetera, um, then you also eliminate the forbidden fruit factor. Yeah, yeah. 
That's true. And um, like I said, I don't... They, <laughs> Um, I can't remember where I, I heard this. I, it might have been one of those Ron Paul things, actually, um, talking about legalizing all drugs. And somebody asked, you know, are you, you know, are you actually talking about legalizing heroin? How dangerous that would be for the country? And in, the response was, well, if I legalized heroin, would you go out and buy heroin tomorrow? Yeah, right. No. Well, yeah. Neither would a whole lot of other people. <laughs> right? Like, exactly. It, it wouldn't. It probably wouldn't change your behavior that much. No. There's there's very few people that that are only not using these substances because they're illegal. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, yeah. Not, exactly. That's not actually stopping most people. Yeah, because the access is <laughs> there because there's a market for it. Yeah. You know. Um. No, I agree. Yeah. More. You wanted to. Uh, no, to I mean say that, that that pretty well sums it up. But it. Like I say, just kind of in closing, you know, this is a real problem. I, I appreciate the fact that something is that's being talked about and something's mm-hmm. trying to be done about it, but it just pains me because the wrong prescriptions are being put down. Yeah. Well, and th- this is actually another example of people using the force of government to impose their moral position on others. Yeah. I, and yeah. I should say, like, with scare quotes around moral. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because the truth is that even if drug use is immoral, yeah. it's also immoral for you to use force to regulate what other people do with themselves. Yeah. You still own your body. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, as libertarians, that's that's a big thing for us. Yeah. Like you, you have the right to do with your body what you will. That's part of the trade off for liberty. Yeah. Is that, you know, you have to, there is responsibility and you'll make bad choices. And other people around you will make bad choices. And, you know, but the truth is that they do that anyway. Absolutely. So. (laughs) (laughs) Haven't really changed very much, except that you've made things more expensive. You've made um, addiction taboo and driven it underground instead of giving it the, you know, giving people the opportunity to get help. Yeah. Um, You know, through criminalizing it, it makes people less likely to step forward and, and admit when they realize that they have a problem and most people with a problem actually do recognize that they have a problem. Yeah. And, and the majority of them won't help with it. Yeah. They just, you know, it's but they're a, afraid of the consequences. Exactly. Yeah. So. Um, okay. Uh, do you want to do, let's, let's close with Russia, Ukraine stuff. So let's go to okay. immigration. All right. Sounds good. You've been wanting to talk about this for weeks. Oh, yeah. Weeks. I forgot. Like, So this hasn't really been on my mind today because I had the, the other stuff on my mind. So, yeah. Um, so I guess Governor DeSantis and who's the guy in Texas? I can't remember. <laughs> Abbott. Yeah, Tim Abbott. Abbott. Yeah. Tim Abbott. Isn't um, that Jim? Oh, is it, I don't know. Is it Jim Abbott? It, it might be. I don't, I don't know. know. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think Abbott is the last Something thing. that ends in M. Anyway, the <laughs> Texas governor and the Florida governor have – kind of pulled the stunt, which I'm sure people have heard about, where they're mm-hmm. basically busing and, in one instance, flying immigrants to other parts of the mm-hmm. country. Yeah, the one that really made the news was, um, and presumably DeSantis arranged this, although the immigrants came out of Texas. Yeah. Um, but uh, they flew 50 uh, immigrants to, um, oh, what's that uh, wealthy? Mar- Martha's, Martha's, Martha's Vineyard. Vineyard. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Um, where a bunch of wealthy elites have summer homes and yeah, and apparently stuff. from what I understand, it was only like fifty people. Like so, yeah. it wasn't even like yeah. <laughs> a, a thousands of people. Um, um and it, the response was now. First off, I I actually think that the this political stunt is hilarious. It's very savvy. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I I think that it's it's actually quite funny. Yeah. Um. And I, I think that there's certainly a strong point to be made that, uh, and this this is obviously becoming a theme in this podcast, mm. of that through the vote now, they have imposed their moral position on others yeah. using the force of government to allow Saying immigrants these, in. We have to let these people yes. in. Which, uh, we have to help these people. We have to let them in. You have no right to prevent them from entering this country, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the people that that vote that way um, should also bear part of the cost. It's a whole, it's a whole lot easier if you're in the interior of the country yeah. um, or if you're in the North where you're not really concerned about illegal Canadian immigration yeah, right. um, that uh, 
to say, yes, we should let all these immigrants in and you, you should ha you should take care of them. Um, yeah. It's our moral responsibility to take care of them when you aren't part of us. When you're not, yeah, <laughs> when you're not at the border living in one of those towns, yeah. dealing with the consequences of it. So in this case, they, they shipped 50 immigrants to Martha's Vineyard um, and there was an outcry. Like they, they kept them one night and then they had the military yeah. move them to a military base instead. Yeah. Um, and of course there's like, there's a bunch of homes there that are giant summer homes. Uh, many were not occupied, but the, the response from residents there um, was that they, you know, they don't have the resources to support this, yeah. to support these 50 people. Um, and in fact, they have a, a housing crisis on the island where not even all the people that work there can live on the island, which is true because they can't afford it. Because they can't afford to. Right. Yes, this is the truth. Um, yeah, I mean, this is one of the wealthiest communities in the United States. Yeah. Uh, so one of the wealthiest communities in the United States doesn't have the resources yeah. to support 50 immigrants. Yeah. Now, there are border towns. There are some border towns um, that are reporting like as many as a thousand immigrants, new immigrants a day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> imagine, you think they have the resources? Imagine what they're dealing with as far as, just like you said, just as far as like resources, basic hospitals, schools, like just the basic infrastructure. Housing. Housing, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, just collapsing under this. Yeah. Um, so uh, I did see uh, some Twitter comment that may have been a troll comment or it may have been a, like a good liberal yeah. um, saying, hey, you know, we support these policies of open immigration uh, and the these border uh, areas don't. So it's only fair if we bear the brunt of the cost for the policies that we endorse yeah. instead of leaving those costs to others. Yeah. And I thought that that was a strong argument. I, you know, I, um, I agree with that. Like, yeah. I mean, um, and something else that I think is worth mentioning, at least from everything I can tell is it's not like, because the media is, is acting like these people are just being forced in the buses and shipped to, to places unknown to them. And everything I can tell is that, that they're they're asking these people if they want to go, and it's a voluntary thing. It's not mm -hmm. like they're just like kidnapping these because it's it's been yeah. brought to my attention in the media that like that's how they're treating it. Is like they're talking about trafficking, human laws, trafficking, human, yeah, yeah, and that doesn't seem to be the case, at least from what I can tell. Yeah, I, I do find that particularly um, interesting that they would start to invoke human trafficking um, for these for them being transported from border areas into the interior of the country um, when they're not really up in arms about the trafficking that occurs to get them into the country in the first place. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, you're not there talking, is real human trafficking that's getting say, them into the country. It, well, that's the truth. I mean, what these people are going through to get here is atrocious. Yeah. So the think that putting them on a bus or a plane is that inhumane, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, especially if they're voluntarily doing it. Yeah. Um, but this this also illustrates, I think, um, part of the reason that I that I do try and to maintain the open borders position yeah. myself um, is that, uh, like, you know, the argument that's often made is, well, um, you know, there's we, we can't afford open borders with the system the way it is today, no. um, with the welfare system the way we have it, all the public services. We, we can't afford to have open borders. I don't disagree with that. Yeah. Um, the point that I've always that I that I've been making in response. This is actually after a conversation with Jacob Hornberger that I that I adopted this position because I thought yeah. he made a really strong argument. Yeah. Um. And his point was, who's to say that that having open borders wouldn't instigate that change? Yeah. That maybe people would realize, yeah, we can't afford to do this and maintain open borders. So why don't we get rid of all the immoral things? Yeah including like locking people out of the country and stealing people's money to give to other people. Yeah. Like maybe but, we can end all the immoral things instead of trying to maintain the, the one immoral thing so that we can maintain the, the other, other immoral thing. Yeah. I mean, to me though, that's, that really feels like a collapsitarian argument that, 
I, I can't really get behind. I don't want to well, see... Well, I don't know, but I, I, you see it right here where there are people... Th these people who have been promoting open borders suddenly realize what the problem might be. Yeah. Well, yeah. No, and that's fair, and that's... Like I say, I, I'm all for you that. Know, I, I imagine that this puts some of them in a position where they're maybe reevaluating yeah. like some portion of this. Well, there's no Now, they're going to focus on the immigration problem, not the welfare problem, probably. But yeah. still, I mean, at least it's, a, it's an awakening. Well, and that's the reason I think that this is such a savvy political move, because yeah. it, does, it does shift the conversation into some of this, mm -hmm. um, to what these, these areas are dealing with. And, and it really does blow my mind. And I know Dave Smith talked about this on his podcast, but that some of these communities in Martha's Vineyard didn't like just take these people in and mm -hmm. really like lean into that and yeah. take it as an opportunity for good publicity. Yeah. Um, because they totally could have done that and won this argument. Mm -hmm. um, I think the my, my belief is the reason they didn't do that is because they were afraid that was going to encourage more of it. Yeah. Well, uh, they're, um, they're true NIMBY elite liberals. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, I uh, support this position as long as I don't have to deal with as it. Not as, in my backyard. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's it's like they're not even trying to hide it anymore. You yeah. Know, that, <laughs> just the, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I did. I heard uh, Dave Smith talking about that, too. And I, I thought that that was actually like he, he's right. Um, they could have taken this and completely flipped it. They could have. Um, just by saying, you know, yep, all right, we support, you know, the immigrants coming into this country. Here they are. Yeah. You know, I've got an empty house up there right now. Anyway, I can I can put, you know, six families in my giant ten million dollar home Absolutely. that I have there. Yeah. Um, it, it sh hell, you could uh, put them in tents in a backyard. It would be. Yeah, you know, at least better you're than still, where they came from. Yeah, and it's better than like calling in the military to ship them <laughs> off to a military base, That's, right? You know, so, um, so yeah, a, 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 another example tonight yeah. of um, using government force to like in this case, it's to impose your moral position on others where you don't have to bear the costs, only they do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um. Do you want to move on? Yeah, we can close that one out, like I said. Okay. Because uh, I do want to talk about this pipeline. I do, too. I think it's this is definitely... This is the big thing going on right now as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, um, this is uh, this is the beginning of a hot war. Yeah, uh, I, it, it really feels that way. So when this news came out, I think it was yesterday. Um, was it yesterday or the day before? No, uh, we talked we, about it on Tuesday. Yeah, it came out... Um, the morning of the 27th. It happened overnight the 26th, I think. Okay. Yeah. Or something like that. Well, at any rate, when this news came out, I personally started getting a little nervous. Oh, we missed the Mises Caucus. I missed the Mises Caucus thing oh, last yeah, night. Oh, yeah, I missed it too, too. I completely forgot. Yeah. Sorry, John. It was just like... <laughs> I send, didn't even think about it till the next day. And yeah, I was send like, me another... This is the next day. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I thought about it this morning then. Yeah. yeah. Uh, next time, John, send me a text before to remind me because I got... Yeah, I got to have a reminder. Because I, yeah. I, I had intentions to get on to that. Yeah. All right. Well, anyway. sorry to interrupt. Yeah. No, no, no. Um. Oh, yeah, but when I found out about, when, when the news started coming out about this, I started getting a little nervous because mm -hmm. I was like, because immediately, like, with, before they knew anything other mm -hmm. than that there was gas leaking, yeah. um, it immediately the focus was Russia, like the blame Russia. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I mean, I don't know one way or the other. I think that I, I felt like immediately there was no reason to blame Russia. I don't see where Russia has anything to gain here. Yeah. Um, just from the outside looking in, mm -hmm. like I just, what, I mean, they're going to blow up the pipeline that they're using to sell gas. Yeah. Okay. And the U S immediately stepped in and was like, well, we have no problem filling these voids for these other countries that mm -hmm. need to get this fuel. So, I mean, what's really going on here? Yeah. Well, uh, you remember what I said when you told me about that and that the that they were blaming Russia for it? Yeah. And I was like, that's absolutely absurd. It like, is. That's like the country that I am, uh, I am 99.9% .9 certain that they did not do this. Yeah. Now, it could be a false flag attack, but it's a very expensive one for Russia. Yeah. Um, just uh, just the, the gas that leaked out in the first day. Um, the Russian gas yeah, that leaked yeah. out in the first day yeah. it was worth six hundred to eight hundred million dollars. Yeah, so <laughs> that, that's uh, that's a lot of yeah, that's yeah. a lot of money to that's just leak hit. out into the atmosphere. Yeah, um, and to do that to yourself just seems ridiculous, especially when they can just turn off a valve. 
Well, yeah, because like, hey. the, well, my understanding is they weren't moving anything through at least the second one, um, maybe the no. fir- first one too. I'm not sure, but the second one, because they the reporting I saw said that um, they only had I, they called it preliminary gas or test gas, yeah, in it, which is still real gas, mm-hmm. but it was gas that was never had never hit the was never plans to hit the market. Yeah, well, that's because Germany had turned it off on their side. Yeah. Oh, okay, so so yeah. they were not accepting uh, with, under the gas. U.S. pressure. Germany had turned it off on their side. Gotcha. Um, the uh, the Nord Stream One pipeline that is was functioning before was functioning the war. before. Yeah. Um, there is a problem with some uh, compression turbines. Yeah. Uh, Siemens, um, the you know German company Siemens, is responsible for the maintenance contracts on that. Yeah. But because of the German sanctions on Russia, they can't. Fix it. Work on it. Yeah, they're not permitted to work on it. Um, So (laughs) Germany's in a bad spot here, Um, and and they recognize it too. And and I think that this feeds into like the possibilities of who's responsible here. Yeah, not Germany. Yeah. Well, they need that gas. Yeah. Like this is Um, bad news for them. Yeah. So they had at some point. You've got to think in the Germans' mind. At least at some point, this war is going to be over, and they're going to be able to buy that gas again. Yeah. They could buy it right now. Well, they could Actually, without Putin, the... Pre- Putin has said um, that he is more than happy to uh, send gas to anybody in Europe that needs it if they'll pay for it. Yeah, that's kind of the uh, issue, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you don't get a service without a cost. I mean, that's like, you yeah. got to pay for the product. And But but he's he said repeatedly just, that he is willing to ship the product over, that he can push the gas. All they got to do is turn on the pipeline. And just so we're clear as to why they're not wanting to pay for this gas is because, the, and correct me if I'm wrong, the U.S. kicked them off the SWIFT system. Actually, the European Union kicked so them the off So the European Swift. Union yeah. kicked them off the SWIFT system? Okay. Um, and Which so makes the, it more, it, they can still buy it, it's just more complicated. Yeah, it makes it so that Russia can't really exchange the foreign currency. Yeah. Um, which makes the the currency that they receive that's foreign, like, it makes the euro worthless to them, essentially. Yeah. Um, so Russia responded by saying, okay, we'll continue to sell you gas, but you got to pay in rubles. Yeah, you got to use our currency. Yeah, because yeah. we can't exchange. So yeah. you just got to pay us in, in our currency. Yeah. And, um, and there are countries in Europe that are paying Russia in rubles for gas, and they're getting gas. Well, there you go. Um, now, <laughs> there's... There's a cup. The obviously the biggest beneficiary of this is the United States. Yeah, yeah. Um, we'll come back to that. I was gonna say. I mean, that was blatantly clear to me when I saw the initial reporting. I was like, yeah, if anybody did, had something to gain here, mm-hmm. it was these guys. Yeah, <laughs> us. <laughs> um, the idea that that Russian terrorists are trying to freeze out the EU is silly because the Russians don't need to destroy the pipelines to freeze out the EU. They just don't put gas through. They just turn it off. Yeah. Yeah. Which they're more than capable of doing. Um, Now let's start with, uh, let's start with Poland. Okay. Okay. So um, Poland has been outspoken against the Nord Stream 2 pipeline early on. Okay. Um, And we're actually using their military uh, to harass um, the, the workers, the, yeah, the construction really? of it, um, at times, yeah. um, during its construction. Um, they, <sighs> what's their beef? Um, they would rather have gas transferred through their country in the Yamala. I think it's Yamala pipeline. Yeah. Um, to Germany. Uh, that way they can charge the, these transit costs oh. for it passing through their country. Now, when the war began, they shut the the Polish shut off the Yamala pipeline. Okay. Again, the Russians didn't shut off the gas in this case, but this is a pipeline that runs from Russia to Germany yeah. um, through Poland, and Poland shut it off okay. when the war began. Um, there's also pipelines that run through Ukraine from Russia to Germany, yeah. and Ukraine shut those off. Well, yeah. Okay. I would expect them to. And then Germany shut off the Nord Stream 2. Yeah. And Actually, was, they never opened it. That's what happened. Nord Stream 2 never opened, yeah. Right. But, now, but they shut down Nord Stream 1, though, too, yeah. correct? Yeah. Um. Actually, you know, I'm not 100% on that. Well, at one point, I, I think that at they, one point they are they still did. accepting. Yeah, they definitely did at one point. Um, um, I think that they are still accepting they, some Russian gas. Okay. I don't, I'm I'm not, I I think that they're still getting Russian gas, but, um, anyway, uh, 
And if you go back and listen, go back and listen to all the episodes of this podcast, you'll <laughs> find that we have been talking about the U.S. trying to shut down the Nord Stream Two project way before since Ukraine, the yeah. yeah since the podcast began pretty yeah. much. Um, oh yeah, yeah. In twenty seventeen, something like 18? that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, this has been going on a long time. The U.S. has never wanted this this uh, yeah. project to end. Um, they don't want the Nord Stream two. Uh, the Poland um, they would rather have the uh, gas transfer through them so that they can get the the charges for that. Um, they have also all right. A <laughs> couple of interesting points here. Um, they have also connected the the Polish have been still getting Russian gas during the war. Yeah. Um, however, the day before the espionage, or maybe it was the day of, but I think it was the day before the, the sabotage of the Nord Stream pipelines, um, Poland turned on their extension to the gas pipeline running from Sweden to Germany. Oh, really? Yeah. So they are now, they now have a new source of gas and then yeah. the next day, this happens. This happens. Yeah. Now, um, uh, oh, and the Polish have a, uh, a military base, a naval base, um, not far from where this all happened. Yeah. And um, it also houses their naval combat engineers, who are the underwater explosives people. Well, I was going to say, that was a point I did want to kind of make, is my understanding is, like, this wouldn't be a hard stunt to pull off. You got a big pipe down there, everybody knows where it's at, and... Anybody with a little knowledge on underwater explosives and scuba gear and stuff mm -hmm. could pull this off. Now, it takes a good explosion, though. Well, yeah, um, I'm sure it because does. Because it, it's like the pipe itself is like uh, one and a half or two inches of steel. Okay. Um, and then it's surrounded by steel reinforced concrete that's like, I don't know, four oh, to wow. six inches. So you, so you got to do it right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like you need to, you know, you. You need, you need a real explosion. You need military grade explosives, more than likely, or a lot of explosives, anyway. Yeah. Um, and I, the, uh, I think it was the Swedes. They picked up the explosions on their um, seismic equipment. Did they? And yeah, and said that it would have to be. I think it was something like around two hundred um, pounds of TNT or something like that, or wow. kilos of TNT, yeah. uh, to create the seismic event that they were able to pick up. That they registered, um, yeah. But it was definitely an explosion in the water, not in the crust. Okay. So, so it, it was an explosion on the pipeline. So it was it was man-made. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. an explosion. It was not a seismic event. Gotcha. gotcha. Um, so it's definitely sabotage. Yeah. Somebody done, has done this. Yeah. yeah. They hit two points on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline and one point on the Nord Stream 1 pipeline. Yeah. Um, now, uh, another possibility is Britain. Yeah. Um, Britain has, a uh, like the Polish have the capability kind of, but they would need some help. I think, yeah. um, Britain definitely has the capability. Yeah. Um, I think it would come back around to them being the U S lap dogs more than having a particular interest themselves. Yeah. Um, there may be an interest there. I, I didn't get to read as much, like we've been, we started to ramp busy. up because yeah. of the hurricane. So I, I haven't had as much time. Um, I, I did not read as much as I would like to have read before this podcast, but, yeah. uh, so there may be a, um, an interest by, by the UK, but I don't know what it is. Yeah. Um, except that, uh, they have been certainly pressing. And again, I think this is at the U S behest, but, um, they have been pressing to maintain this war in Ukraine um, and the sanctions against Russia. And uh, Germany had um, some protests like across the country the day before. Oh, and no. I think that there, there may be some concern um, about German dissent from the rest of the EU or the rest of the Western bloc no. um, about the sanctions on Russia. Yeah. Uh, because their people are, are unhappy about not having any energy. And, um, the uh, the German economy will collapse without Russian energy. Yeah, I mean that's just the truth of it. We talked about it on the last I was podcast. Say, we discussed this already. Um, yeah. So the the German economy cannot um, maintain without cheap Russian energy, and uh, and the people in Germany know that. Yeah. And they don't want to lose their job. Actually, a lot of them already have, obviously, but yeah. um, they don't want to lose any more industry in Germany. Um, they don't want uh, to freeze in the winter either. Winter um, is coming. And um, so there were there were protests across Germany 
uh, the day before this happened. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it could just be that the UK did it because they're concerned about German descent. Um, and now they've taken away essentially the possibility of Germany going back, dropping sanctions and then getting that gas back. Yeah. All right. Uh, of course the same applies to the U S yeah. The U S is benefiting in myriad ways from this. Um, those German industries that can't afford the energy in Germany, yeah. uh, have been openly courted by the United States to open up, um, locations in the United States and yeah. get U S energy at a lower cost. Yeah. Shipped on boats over there. Yeah. By the way. Um, well, no, is it not come on boats? No, no, no. I mean, they, they're talking about having German businesses, German industries open up locations in the United States. Oh, oh, okay. I got you. I'm yeah. You. Uh, the U.S. Yeah. yeah. U.S. has been openly courting German businesses to come over here where the energy is cheaper. I got you. Okay. Um, there's also the other uh, LNG sales to Europe yeah. um, by the United States, uh, which is the reason, I think, is the reason um, that the U.S. worked so hard to keep Nord Stream 2 from being completed and then from opening in the first place yeah. um, is because without the cheap Russian gas, then uh, Europe has to buy more expensive uh, U.S. LNG. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, in addition, just as another point of reference, um, the USS Kearsarge had uh, helicopter flights in the area of the Nord Stream 2 detonations, um, just a couple of days before. Yeah. Uh, and they also carry, um, experimental, uh, underwater, uh, unmanned underwater, unmanned underwater vehicles. Hmm. So, uh, submarine drones. Okay. Essentially. Yeah. D drone subs. Yeah. Um, they're for mine detection and removal. Now, I don't know this a hundred percent, but my understanding is that most mine removal is actually a detonation of the mine. So yeah. you use a shaped charge to detonate the mine, yeah. which means probably these UUVs that they use to uh, find Could mines very easily also can place a shaped charge. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um. Anyway, so there there were some people that tracked uh, heli flights off of the USS Kearsarge a few days before. They're right along the pipeline area where these um, on the Nord Stream two where these uh, detonations occurred. Yeah. So maybe, maybe not. I mean, it's hard to say, but they certainly, they had the, the means, motive, and opportunity is what you would talk about <laughs> if this was a true crime yep. podcast. <laughs> um, so uh, it doesn't make any sense for the Russians to have done this. This is only a damage to their own economy. Um, they, they see no benefit from this. The, the group that benefits, has the greatest benefit to show from this is the United States. Yeah, without question. Um, and then uh, secondarily, um, Britain, mostly just because they do whatever the U.S. asks, it seems. Yeah. Um, and Poland, because they have uh, some economic interests in um, maintaining the transit across their country from Russia to Germany. Yeah. Also, there's a, a really strong anti-Russian sentiment in, um, in Poland. Really? Yeah. Well, they were occupied. In well, yeah, I guess that would make sense. Yeah. Um, so just kind of predictions. Do you think that we'll figure out who done this? No, um, not explicitly. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I think that we've already figured out who. who I mean, I it. think we have, too. I'm just saying, <laughs> do you think that the world will figure out? Because here's so here's where my concern is, because. I immediately kind of came to some of these same conclusions that you've kind of came to as far as the U S goes, um, that, I mean, we more likely did this. Um, if Russia finds out that we absolutely committed this crime, like what kind of world does that take us to? Um, I mean, tensions are already pretty good. And the U S has said to that. So it looks like, um, Friday, um, Russia is going to claim those territories that they had the referendum in. Yeah. And the U.S. is adamantly saying that under no circumstances will they ever recognize those as Russia territories. Um, I don't know. I mean, I just... Yeah, I don't know. That's a problem. We still don't recognize North Korea either. Well, no, we don't. And it, But it's one more kind of link in the chain, you know? Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, um, I we're certainly in a in a spot where it seems like like the the farther down the path we go, the harder it is for anybody to turn back. Well, and that's that's um, what worries me is exactly what you just me said. Too. That the the further you go, especially if it does come out that the U.S. did this, and we don't know one way or the other. Well, here's the thing. I, I think that um, I think that there will never be proof. Yeah. And as long as there's never proof. You can always there's deny. There's deniability. Yeah. Um, and I think that what we'll probably end up with is the same kind of thing happening on the other side. Yeah. So say that we start transporting LNG across the Atlantic to Europe. Yeah. Some accident happens to some of these ships. Yeah, but the, the fear is... is and we can never prove that it's Russia. Of course, I don't think that we care as much about that as the Russians do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You're probably <laughs> right about that. <laughs> which is... Crazy that so we would backwards. go to these links to do this to them, and then when they do it to us, ca- us kind of just brush it off. Yeah, I. But um, but I do think you're right. Like I think that we would be more likely to just kind of be like, ah, eh, you know, cost even of doing like business. even these referendums and and so forth. Like it, everything the the way that um that Putin announced the special military operation and so forth, like everything that the Russians have done. Um, at this point and like throughout a, a number of conflicts and near conflicts, yeah. uh, they have done by international law. Yeah. They have followed the, the letter of the law. Like this is one thing that Putin seems to be a stickler about. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, they announced very clearly using the same excuses that we, that the UN has used to intervene in conflicts in other places. Yeah. Um, they, uh, you know, so I, and the truth is that if you look at our history over the past um, century, <laughs> um, maybe not quite, but um, yeah. the the United States certainly has um, has ta- has taken the position to international law that we make it, we enforce it, and so we do what we want. Yeah, yeah, and we're not beholden to it. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I I don't know. I I actually think that the like a real serious conflict is most likely to start from the United States than from Russia. And this yeah. is actually an example. Like if the U S actually yeah. did do the sabotage on the Nord Stream pipelines, yeah. this is an example. Yeah. Um, you know, because the, the war in Ukraine is horrible. It's been horrible to Ukraine. A lot of civilians have died, but the, the gloves have been on for Russia. Yeah. Oh yeah. During this conflict, whether you want to believe that or not, yeah. Um, this could have been far more destruct. This is a you, the I mean, Russia about- is like the the fourth largest military in the world. Yeah. They've got something like four hundred thousand active troops. Wow. Yeah. Um, they. Well, and the just, truth is that they the, could have the, crushed Ukraine if they had gone in gloves off. Yeah. And been willing to just destroy just, the country. Just rubbleizing. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, this could have long since been over. Of course, this could have long since been over in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, this could have long since been over with uh, the the Donbass republics being recognized as independent, or even yeah. still being part of Ukraine, but just given um, a, a a measure of political independence that Ukraine had already agreed to in Minsk too, yeah. and with Crimea being accepted as Russian territory, which is nothing. It's yeah. Not anything but Russian territory. Yeah. I mean, that's just the truth. <laughs> yeah. That's the facts. Um, that could have happened in like April. Yeah. That we could have we could have two months into this been done with it without the Ukraines having lost much. Yeah. But here and, we but here we are. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. Things like this always make me nervous. Like I mean, that, this sparks like this is how like hot war starts. Mm-hmm. This is what makes me really nervous about this is that it does seem like we are not taking seriously the threats that Russia is making about um, nuclear attacks. Yeah. Now. Oh yeah, because he made he made more statements this week mm-hmm. about what they're willing to do to protect their provinces. Yeah. Or yeah. provinces. Provinces. Yeah. 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 Provinces like where you find something in an archaeological dig. It's like ah, anyway. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the archaeologist over here. <laughs> <laughs> so I used to do forensic archaeology. Uh, I know you did. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I, I, yeah, I, I am concerned about this. Uh, I think that the the U.S. is more likely to start a nuclear war than Russia is. Yeah. No. Um, 
but uh, I also think that the U.S. is not completely unlikely to start a nuclear war because yeah. I still think that the the U.S. believes that there's some kind of difference between tactical nukes and strategic nukes, yeah. and that they that there are people in the Pentagon. Um, that really believe that a tactical nuclear weapon is just a bigger kind of bomb and doesn't mean anything. represent any kind of real, um, I don't know, real increase in hostilities. Yeah. But the Russians don't see it that way, and they've made it very clear. Yeah. But we don't seem to be listening. Yeah. And and so that well, makes me nervous. But um, I, I hope I, I don't honestly I don't think that um, that a a nuclear war happens in any other way than an accident. Yeah. But the longer this goes, the more likely an accident happens. There's an accident. Exactly. And and that's really kind of where my fear lies Mm -hmm. is like, I, I I don't think we're going to consciously dive into this, but, Mm -hmm. um, but who knows? I mean, it's, it's a crazy world out there. Well, and this is why I'm a big advocate of just abolishing nuclear weapons entirely. Um, the, truth is that the United States has conventional military power to be just as destructive as a nuke. Yeah. It's just more resource intensive. Yeah. Right. Um, we can absolutely eliminate any nation on earth with conventional weaponry, just like we can with nuclear weaponry. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really the, the U S is placed to be the first one to say, Hey, look, yeah, we're getting rid of all of this stuff. Yeah, like the danger that it represents to the planet is just not worth. But and this know, this goes this, back to just government in general. Um, they're not capable of doing that because mm-hmm. we're our our government has to be the bigger man, and and we're the police of the world, mm-hmm. and we're not the we're not that country that leads by example. As much as it pains me to say that. Beyond um, that, there's big money in the for the companies that that, that produce produce our nuclear maintain, arsenal. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, and that's the truth too. And at the end of the day, follow the money, mm-hmm. um, which is the reason that I think that we're co- culpable here. Because at the end of the day, with any situation, especially when you're dealing with governments, follow the money. Well, and um, Biden is on camera saying uh, that if Russia were to invade Ukraine, we would eliminate Nord Stream too. Well, there and you I think that he used those words or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, the reporter asked him, well, um, how are you going to do that since the pipeline's under uh, German control? Yeah. And uh, We're the U.S. and we'll do what we want. Well, he said, well, you know, well, we, we have our ways or something like yeah. that. I mean, Well, and we, we are. I mean, then. Like, that's something, by the way, that if I'd had more time, I would have pulled that clip. Well, let's look for uh, that one for that. I think that'd be, if you can find that, that'd be a good one for next week. Yeah. Um, if nothing else, just to toss in so people can hear. Mm-hmm. But, um, I mean, but we, the U.S. has that attitude about things. Yeah. Is that, that we're the big dog. Nobody's going to mess with us. And. And that's we're going to do what we want. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, uh, that attitude is part of the reason that this um, conflict has escalated as much as it has. Absolutely. Uh, we have no interest, like this nation, for the people, for the citizens of the United States. Yeah. We have no interest, strategic or otherwise, in Ukraine. We just don't economic, strategic, not like in yeah. no way. There's yeah. there's nothing that connects us to Ukraine, yeah. but it is Russia's border, yeah. and it has been historically part of Russia. And in fact, uh, Kiev is the origin of the Russian Empire from like very early on. Yeah. Like it's not Russian anymore. I mean, it's like yeah. Kiev anyway, and the the western part of the well, the northwest part of the country yeah. um, is something different. Yeah. Like they're, you know, I, they, I think they trace their ancestry to some kind of Nordic. Anyway, doesn't yeah. matter. Um, they're not ethnically Russian, but the, the South, uh, Southeast of the country is. Yeah. Um, and that, uh, territory has been historically Russian and Crimea particularly. And, um, you know, uh, actually a, a fair portion of Ukraine, um, was, I'm going to say purchased. I mean, it was kind of purchased. It was like, uh, a negotiation that ended a war with the Turks or something um, by Catherine the Great in the 18th century. Wow. Yeah. In like the 1780s or 1790s, that territory became a part of Russia. Yeah. Anyway. 
Um, A lot of history there. Yeah, so they certainly have far greater interest in it than us. And the real problem with the United States military and security or whatever establishment um, is that we don't seem to pay any attention to anybody else's interests. We have to recognize that other nations have legitimate security concerns around themselves and that we can't just ignore them. Yeah. And this, Russia is not Afghanistan. No. Or Iraq. It's not some you know little podunk yeah. country that we can just push around. Yeah. Like Russia may not be have the same power as the Soviet Union once had. Yeah. But they're not a pushover. They're yeah. not a doormat. It's a real military. Yeah. yeah. It's a I mean, real it's, modern military with electronic warfare and modern weaponry and it may not be as good as ours. Yeah. But when those bombs start falling in the US though, you ain't gonna care. Yeah, it doesn't much matter. Yep. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> And on that shining note. Yeah, we're an hour in. We may as well wrap it up. Yeah. <laughs> we still so. can't get it back down to like 50 minutes. Yeah, it's not going to happen. Uh, no, it'll happen. Oh, will it? It'll happen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and pay closer attention and not wander <laughs> so much, maybe. Nah, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Um, so, yeah, let, no, say something positive. I... I would, so well, we've been kind of going down this road. I've been trying to pull something, but I don't have a whole lot. I don't know. I was trying to think of something. Well, I I don't really think that we'll have a nuclear war. Yeah. Um, I think that there is enough recognition on both sides of the dangers. Well, truth be told, <laughs> oh, and this this is going to sound horrible. Not willfully go into a nuclear war, anyway. Uh, I think that Russia has historically. Putin in particular showed enough restraint to keep us out of something like that. And that's as an American, like a red blooded American, it pains me to even say that. Yeah. But the the history is what the history is. Yeah. And the man has shown more restraint than we ever would. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, unfortunately, um, his restraint is interpreted as weakness by the military establishment here. Yeah. Um, but that's not what it is. No. It's not weakness. No. He's not weak. He's no. cautious. Yeah. Calculated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, hopefully that's enough. Hopefully it is, like I say. It has been so far. But he's also in a position now where he's, like, kind of let things go to a point that sound that's kind of out of nowhere and I don't want to back up for over the last 20 years <laughs> to try and catch us up. Yeah. I mean, we've talked about it before, but um I actually uh I think it was Scott Horton um I was listening to that was saying, you know, like talking about well we can't, you know, people saying we can't back down to nuclear power because they're threatening to use nuclear weapons like that's seen as appeasement yeah. um or whatever in this country, but you could just as easily make the case that uh, that Putin has been appeasing the United States for the last, you know, many years, decade or more. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and that now, you know, it's finally crossed a line where he's no longer willing to appease the United States. That yeah. we've been the bully, that we've been the one pushing the line, pushing the limits over and over again. And he's let it go and let it go and let it go. And now he's not anymore. Yeah. And I, I actually think that a really strong case could be made could be that made way. For that, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, because we, the United States, is the country that has, over the last twenty, thirty years, yeah. um, has killed something like two million people. Yeah. It's the U.S. military that's done that. Oh yeah, not the Russian military. Yeah. Now, not to say that the Russian military hadn't killed people during that time either, yeah. but their numbers dwarf ours. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're involved in everything. Yeah. We're everywhere. Like, um, so, like, who's really the bad guy here? I, everybody is is really the answer. Like, there's no governments. Yeah, w- governments wars are between governments, not between people. Yeah, yeah. And government's the bad guy. You want to you want to reel some of this in? Start reeling in that government. Um, and we really need to get active on this. Like, we really need to start calling, writing letters, et cetera, to our representatives and senators and saying that we want no part of what's going on in Ukraine. Yeah. That we are not willing to risk American cities for the Ukrainians. Yeah. yeah. Like, they, you know, we may have pushed them into this, but they're on their own now. Like, this is not, this is yeah. um, escalated to a point where we don't need to be a part of it. Yeah. And I'm sorry for the Ukrainians. Yeah. They shouldn't have listened to us. Right. <laughs> you know, but I don't want to be, I, I don't, 
I don't want this country um, to put itself in a position where it is under threat or is threatening the rest of the world because that's the that's the that's truth it. of a nuclear war. Yeah, yeah. It, they're go. not localized. Yeah, yeah. So um, we we do need to get active on this and start start contacting people. Yeah. Um, I have a letter. I'll uh, I don't know. I'll figure out how to post it on facebook or something that you can just copy and like change some information and i mean i yeah um and sign it and send it in yourself i have no problems with you uh stealing my letter yeah yeah none whatsoever (laughs) let's do it (laughs) yeah uh it is open source as far as i'm concerned so um yeah let's let's bring this to a quick close yeah and not in the bad way (laughs) yeah all right (laughs) actually all the ways are bad ways at this point i think but yeah. Um, without, you know, without any real bright lights. Yeah. <laughs> Peaceful resolution. Mm-hmm. All right. So I don't know that I made it any better. <laughs> <laughs> well, you tried. <laughs> uh, that was, I thought I was going somewhere and then yeah. it didn't, it didn't work out. But, um, yeah. Uh, follow us on, here's all the closing stuff. Yeah. Um, follow us on Facebook. Uh, you can subscribe on iTunes, Podbean, YouTube. We actually have an Instagram page, but we've never done anything with it. I'm hoping that I can maybe talk somebody else into taking over that. Cause I don't really do the social media thing. Um, we'll, we'll see. I got a couple of people that I can talk to maybe, yeah. you know, that what'll happen though, is that we'll have to start taking some pictures. <laughs> never been the big fan of that either. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's a uh, price you pay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you can subscribe on iTunes, Podbean, or YouTube. Um, if we're taking pictures, we may as well start doing videos on YouTube. We could do that. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, that's just like one more thing to set up, man. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a dedicated room. If, like if I had a dedicated studio in my house, I wouldn't have a problem with that. Yeah. Um, but I have to convert we, this room every time <laughs> that we record. We need to build you a studio, man. Yeah. We need to make this a revenue stream first hey, there you go <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that later too yeah. um if we're still here and uh let's see yeah subscribe um like and share uh comment you can always email me at michael at the liberty um reviews criticisms interaction tell your friends all that stuff and uh we plan, I, man, I have no idea what my schedule yeah, is going to be like. Yeah, your work's going to get crazy. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what my schedule is going to be like next week. But well, we'll um, find the day. Yeah, we, we plan to be back next week uh, when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Mm-hmm.